Okay, I think it's noon, so we'll begin. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Bureau of Economic Geology Summer Seminar Series. I'm Evan Sidwell. I'll be your host today. As you might know, this series is designed to showcase more than just the work we do here at the Bureau. Uh, it also showcases the hobbies and the interest of our staff, uh, university members, and, and many people abroad. Our speaker today is Dr. Claudia Mora, the Dean of the Jackson School of Geosciences. Before joining us here at UT, Dean Mora worked as a professor at the head, uh, as head of the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, or she calls it the other UT. Afterwards, she began research at Los Alamos National Laboratory as a research scientist group leader in the Earth Environmental Sciences Division, and then as deputy division leader of the chemistry division. Her career path required working broadly across geosciences and intersectional disciplines from petrology to paleoclimate, soil sciences, and dendrochronology, unconventional reservoirs to biofuel co-processing, uranium exploration to nuclear non-proliferation. She's a past president of the Geological Society of America and a counselor for the International Union of Geological Sciences and a graduate of the University of Wisconsin-Madison Department of Geological Sciences, where she earned her PhD, Rice University, where she earned her master's, and the University of New Mexico, where she earned her bachelor's. She and her husband, Pete, share five children in various stages of adulting, a golden retriever, Osito, an old adobe forever home in Taos, New Mexico. Before we begin today, I wanna to remind everybody to please mute your microphone as a respect to the presenter. Uh, you can feel free to ask questions in the chat um, or you can unmute yourself at the end of the presentation and ask them then. So without further ado, Dean Moore. Thank you, Evan. And, and thanks all of you for inviting me to, to give this presentation. Um, I took it uh, to heart that this was an informal presentation and meant to talk a little bit about some of my hobbies at, or a hobby of mine, um, because, because as Dean, I'm not doing a lot of research, um, but uh, my hobby in this case might be relevant to you because one, one thing I'm very interested in is, is, is money, <laughs> money for science in particular. Um, and over the past number of years, as, as a, a department chair or as a manager, I've thought a lot about um, why people give us money, where and 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 um, how we get it, and how we find it, and so I just wanted to to kind of uh, share a little uh, a little discussion of the the history of science of funding, and then some of the things that are I think happening right now with with NSF. So I'm going to go ahead and. Um, I, I initially started this talk up, up, up to a couple of days ago. I think I was starting it um, around 1800. So basically I was, it was in the US and I, and I decided that would probably insult virtually every global citizen that we have in the Jackson School and rightfully so because science was done long before the United States was a country. Um, and uh, so I've taken it maybe to some extremes and uh, what we, I think we do know is that the, the very earliest science was undoubtedly self-funded, if you can even use the term funded for when, when there was no money invented yet. Um, but uh, this is a, a picture of Neanderthals. Uh, recently, the research on Neanderthals suggests that they did have the ability to an understanding to use flint uh, and an iron source to create sparks and to create their own fires. So I imagine the earliest experiment was really this guy uh, trying to figure out what of the which two rocks to pick up to bang together and noticing that some of them didn't work and some of them did. Um, let's see. Um, their science was was perhaps uh, most most greatly advanced early on in the in the Chinese Empire um, in in China where it was mostly the byproduct of, of the needs and the goals of the, of the, of the uh, emperors. And in particular, this is, this is actually an early map. It's, it's made on paper, which of course the Chinese also uh, evolved, uh, first to evolve. You can see um, actually some contours on here. So this, they were aware of, of uh, how to draw a hill on a two, in two dimensions. Uh, but because they were oftentimes at war with each other, they developed a compass, uh, they developed a crossbow. Um, 
And this was really a time when, again, that was the needs of the, of the nation as determined by the, its leader or the emperor um, to, to drive, driving the science and paying for it. And this is sort of thematic throughout history until uh, pretty much um, the, the 18th century. Um, science was supported by, by the noble, by nobility and by religious patronage. Uh, and I sort of uh, reached across a number of places here. Uh, science was greatly advanced by the Greeks. Um, this is a piece of a manuscript. You can see the it was not written on paper, but very thin wood. Um, a piece of manuscript by, by Euclid. Um, and, uh, oops, sorry. Um, there, there was uh, the, the confluence of the, the Greeks uh, and the, and the uh, Persian empire. Uh, in Persia, there was a tremendous amount of focus on the evolution of medicine. And in fact, the, the sort of development of our modern medical practices, modern medical schools and hospitals. And then in India, um, the, the Indians were advancing mathematics quite a bit, giving us um, uh, uh, in particular zero, giving us the, the, the number zero. Um, let's see. Everyone knows this guy, Galileo. Well, Galileo and, and moving from the middle, from the medieval time in towards the Renaissance, Galileo, um, this is some of his work. This is uh, the Copernican view of the, of, the, of the universe. Really around Galileo in his orbit were his patrons and, and science moved from being simply um, more religious, from, from being uh, run in, for war to being run uh, or to being done uh, for enlightenment, if you will, and uh, was supported largely by patrons. These are the Medici family uh, who were his major patrons and the Catholic church who was actually um, a patron, even though it's ironic in this case, because they did they had a falling out with Galileo, um, were patrons of a lot of the science that were, was done. Um, and the patronage model fell, fell apart though, um, sort of towards the beginning of the, of the 18th century um, when the, the Royal Academies were formed uh, in, in France. Um, it was initiated by, by um, uh, Louis XIV and then the Royal Society of London was developed shortly thereafter. And these were then learned societies in, and the societies themselves took a role in gathering the funding for their, for their um, scientists. But oftentimes the scientists involved were really what we used to call gentlemen scientists. And I say gentlemen because at that time they were virtually all men. Um, and these were men from, uh, from typically from families of means, uh, families who could afford to send children uh, for education. And, uh, and then they were the, the gentleman scientists, I'm thinking about Darwin, for example, uh, Newton, they, these were uh, people who would then be funded by their society or who had their own money to, to support um, their scientific endeavors. Um, as we moved into this, uh, the, the, the um, 20th century, uh, th that was a time where I call it a sort of a strong um, appearance of do-it-yourself science. Uh, in other words, self-funded science, a pay-it-yourself science. These were largely scientists who were uh, inventors and paid for their science um, through their inventions, through the value of their inventions on the market. And that included Thomas Edison and, and Nikola uh, Tesla. Um, let's see. Jumping into sort of in, in the US, um, of course, Tesla and, and uh, Edison were both in the US, um, federal funding in the US uh, took root sort of in the 18th century, or sorry, the 19th century, but it was mostly driven by um, our need to take stock or to steward our national uh, resources and our national domain. So the earliest of, of these was the Coast and Geodetic Survey, which later became NOAA. And uh, this, this survey would, this was a survey that should try to map the coastlines and, and, the, and the, the harbors, for example, of the new country. Um, 
short, as, as the country expanded and there became a lot of land available, the, the government had the land grant college at, land grant act that gave uh, land to the states, the sale of which would um, actually go to support the education of the um, of the of the agricultural and engineering specialists that were necessary to to um, grow the country, and so that's the origin of the Aggies. There, um, the USGS came along in 1879. By now, we're an enormous enormous country. We've taken on a lot of territory, and we really had a need to map and to um, and to quantify the resources on that territory. So. Um, this is the, and, and, and it's really shortly thereafter that, that uh, BEG um, got started. The, the real, the real uh, boom and, and, and creation of the strong link between the federal government and science happened during wartime. And it happened during World War I to some degree. Uh, governments became very quickly uh, identified that it was the science and the technology that gave them advantage at war in making, it, in making better weapons. And so wartime really became the mother of invention, if you will, um, it always has been. And the Manhattan Project, which was started, um, so which actually started with this letter uh, from, from uh, Albert Einstein to FDR in 1939, uh, telling them that he, believed it was, he, he needed to explain to him that the work of scientists in France as well as in uh, Germany uh, uh, were leading to an understanding of nuclear chain reactions and the possibility of using that for a weapon. Um, and that kind of started a, a few years of slow start um, supporting supporting uh, Seaborg and, 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 and um, Enrico Fermi in Chicago, for example, in his in his experimental uh, to try to to try to to get a chain reaction, nuclear chain reaction going, uh, and then accelerated in in the, around 1942 when the um, oops, jeez, sorry, um, what happened just here? Um, you'd think I just have fat fingers, so. When, when uh, they formed the, the Manhattan Project itself, which was the project to develop the nuclear bomb, having an, just enough information, and I mean just enough information to, to know that they, they could create a, a chain reaction and that they could, it would release a lot of energy. Most people know this guy, um, Oppenheimer, who was uh, the science head of, of the development of the bomb. Not as many people know this person, but he's probably should be more famous than Oppenheimer. This is Leslie Groves. And he was um, the, in the Army Corps of Engineers and had the, uh, the general had a, the, re, the job of actually getting the, the, the materials and all of the hardware together uh, to make the bomb uh, in, in time or, or in parallel with Oppenheimer and others figuring out actually how to do that as well. So this was a tremendously expensive under, uh, undertaking. They didn't know, for example, how they were going to, what the best way would be to separate isotopes. And so they, they basically uh, built one, one center for isotopic, or they built multiple centers for isotope separation using different methodologies because they needed to, they, they weren't sure what was going to work best. They didn't have time to try them uh, in, in, in sequence. All of these sites uh, contributed to the, the Manhattan Project, whether it was in raw materials, uh, in, um, uh, in, in raw materials, in pluton enriched plutonium, enriched uranium, and uh, in some of the uh, metallurgy and some of the, um, uh, what's it called? The munitions uh, building. And, if we look at th this is an estimate of what it or this is the, an estimate of what the project cost um, in those three years, the project was about $1.9 billion, which if, if you think about all that they, um, they achieved, and in three years, you might say that's, that's actually pretty cheap. At the time, that was a, a large amount of the, of the US budget, it, it was a lot of money, but nowhere near the, the um, 
millions of, uh, or sorry, the trillion dollars that that uh, World War II probably cost the the, the globe, uh, or the uh, nearly um, one trillion dollars that it cost the United States. So um, after the after the war, then um, it became very clear to the to the government that that science is science was the way to the future was was the way to support um, the, the advancement of our society and to give us um, to give us security uh, in the world. Um, and this report by Vannevar Bush, who was in the director of of uh, sort of federal science efforts at the time of, of the Manhattan Project, emerging from the Manhattan Project, he, he did a, two things. The first thing is he was the chief person who convinced uh, the federal government that nuclear weapons should be managed in, by civilians and not by the military, which they always have been since then. Uh, and also he wrote this book uh, or this note called um, Science, the Endless Frontier, uh, which called for the creation of a civilian science uh, organization, which uh, became the, the National Science um, Foundation. And, and these are two quotes by him. He was, he was, again, also certain that really scientific knowledge was the capital uh, for, for progress uh, and, and in, in the world, progress and security in the world. Um, I put this this quote in because it's funny. He he wasn't saying just throw money at the scientists. He was saying throw money at the scientists and get out of their way. Don't try to overmanage it. This was a very distinct way of doing science and very individualistic way of doing science that was really adapted by the NSF as their MO for the for a long long time. Uh, was was we'll fund you. We won't direct you. Um, and so that these two things, this this uh, creation of the NSF and then creation of an of an ethos of independent work, um, really was the what drove the the scientific enterprise in our uh, country for a long time. At least the basic research one. Um, there were some good things that came out of this time period, out of out of the um, out of the nuclear um, developments. Uh, as I said, they were the nukes were put in the hands of the of civilian. Um, there evolved interest in nuclear power and the development of nuclear power, the development of radioisotopes uh, for medicine, and and probably a lot of a lot of uh, our papas would be um, would would be dead if not for these radioisotopes that are, are central to everything or, or to many measurements uh, in the in the uh, in medicine. This was also a period of the Cold War, though, and um, the, the the Soviets were just as fast to adapt to science, um, the the idea that science would advance them. Uh, but their focus was mainly uh, in weaponry and in advancing weaponry. And so um, uh, the, the the there were a number of of science races that happened. The most um, obvious of which was the space race. Um, we were very far behind the Soviets in development of, of, of rockets and failed. we had failure after failure. Um, the Apollo program was sort of the, the second big science effort we, that the United States made as a, driven by, from a federal, um, by, by federal goals. Um, and it was actually one of the, it was, um, it turned out to be the most expensive endeavor, uh, most expensive scientific endeavor that uh, that the US ever undertook. It had some spin-offs as well too, obviously. There's uh, so many things from the space program that, that were spun off, um, uh, Teflon, for example, but also the Tang and space food sticks, maybe if you remember those. Thankfully, those actually failed in the market. Um, Moving out of the 60s, we went into the 70s, and this is a this is a, a diagram of 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 uh, the cost of oil uh, per barrel and sort of a constant 2015 dollars in, in the top green. And I think you can see that after a decade, after a, a century of having um, very low cost fuel and energy, 
uh, the early 70s, uh, OPEC turned off the spigot and uh, there was an, an, an oil, the oil crisis in the early 70s. Um, and uh, if you were around there, as many of us, well, I certainly was, uh, people were lined up for blocks and miles for gasoline. Um, in response, the government uh, decided it needed to pull the 20, it had some 20 organizations in the government that were dedicated to energy, none of them doing much of anything and certainly nothing coordinated. And uh, it pulled them all together uh, in order to create um, in order to create uh, the ERDA, um, I can't remember, Energy Resource Development Agency, um, and then ultimately very quickly to create uh, DOE in, in uh, 1999. So it's kind of a surprise to think that DOE is as young as it is, uh, but, but it, it's quite young. Um, and it was created then out of that particular crisis. So, We've done a lot of, of big science in this country and with, with uh, a lot of federal funding, the mission driven, driven science was clearly always motivated by need uh, and funded in crisis. So in war, during war, during the Cold War, and then during the energy wars. Uh, and then if you look at, um, at, at uh, federal funding for science, these are, these are actually just the, um, yeah, these are the federal funds for science. You see that from 19, from 19, or from 2000 on, we basically had a flat, um, uh, flat investment. Um, you could say it could be that we haven't had a crisis, the magnitude of the Cold War or World War II or the energy crisis since then. And you can imagine what kinds of things might actually drive what kinds of, of new crises might drive an investment in science. But so far, there hasn't been a, lo a lot of motion on that, um, a, lo a lot of change in the, in the budgeting for science since then. Um, this is sort of 1953 to, to 2018, uh, federal spending um, in constant dollars, um, but federal spending, um, sorry, not in constant dollars, federal spending on, um, defense and non-defense R&D. And I think, um, I think what you see is uh, while defense spending might, might come and go depending on the perceived threats, the, the threat post 9, you know, post 911 um, and the Cold War um, and non-defense R&D sort of rides on top and doesn't really change much in terms of its value. But, but this picture is a little bit deceptive because it's showing that, the, that more, there's larger and larger federal spending on, on uh, R&D, but not really as a sort of in, is, as a percentage of the federal budget. The federal budget also has been changing at the same time. So here you see coming out of the Apollo program, there's just really a small bump associated with, with the energy crisis. But in, in terms of real dollars, the federal R&D out, outlay has actually decreased uh, over time as a percentage of the federal budget. Um, R&D has a percentage of discretionary spending within that budget has also been pretty flat, flat at a higher percentage, 10% or so of the, of the discretionary spending um, about, let's we go back here about, um, about 4%, 3.5% of, um, of the total federal budget. And, and that, that number just sits there. Um, and uh, there are a number of, and it, well, I'll just say it sits there. Um, when you look at the trends by the agency, again, you'll see defense bump ups. Um, defense is this dark color at the bottom. Um, but then the entire non-defense budget just kind of rides on top and really doesn't change much. Um, if you just kind of look at here, there's, it seems like there's greater investment, but it's almost all in the, on the defense side and not on the civilian side, um, except for this uh, odd period where they threw in 2009, the stimulus, our, the, the a ARRA money that came out from the stimulus. Um, it's a little bit hard to see the increase. This dark blue is the NIH, sorry, this light blue down here is the NIH budget. 
and it, it's a little hard to track its doubling, but if you move back to 1990 and then compare it to, so for example, 2010, you clearly see the pretty much the only thing in the non-discretionary federal budget that's increased is, is uh, NIH. Um, and it, this is clear, even more clear if you sort of break down the trends in non-defense R&D by function, uh, in health and space. You see the Apollo, the space programs here got a very large percentage of the of the discretionary budget in the 60s. That's when a lot of uh, people in my generation decided to be scientists. Um, and then um, the budgets uh, had have sort of changed much more dramatic or not changed at all since the 80s, except for NIH, the health budget, which has doubled or tripled. Um, it's not, I, I think this is a period I like to call the age where science is being controlled by things that senators perceive can kill them. Um, within the, the, the most egalitarian um, agent, science agency with respect to to uh, the type of science it funds is the National Science Foundation. And you can see here as it separated out um, the, the proportion of the budget that goes to biology, to computer science, to engineering, to geo, et cetera, um, has actually not really changed. Again, um, it's a little bit like the, the last 20 years, it's a little bit like the UT budget as I'm coming to understand, which is driven not by need or, or enrollments, but by but by legacy. Um, legacy is very difficult. Once you have a program that makes six million dollars, that gets six million dollars a year, it's very hard to turn that program down to three million or to make it disappear and move the money to a different program. There's a tremendous amount of inertia uh, in federal science funding. Um, DOE is a little bit faster to to uh, create and um, to create and to close up shop on different programs. Um, the, the, the most of the science budget here, the Office of Science in dark blue, that the Office of Science is what gets um, the tends to get the largest of the increases in DOE. The applied energy offices, which is this wedge between the blue and the gold, um, has been slowly increasing through time, um, but um, pretty slowly. Um, and then riding on top of that is the um, NNSA budget, the budget for atomic um, research and, and, and weapon stewardship, et cetera. So that, that has, a, has grown recently, the last five years, just uh, as um, the government recognized that, the, it, that its stable of weapons is very, very old and it needs to, it needs to demonstrate that they are still working and to begin to produce new pits for the for the weapons we have because plutonium over time does away with itself um okay so one of the reasons why the budget um is so stayed or so stable at the federal level give or take you know a couple hundred million which um is really just a few percentage of, of the budget uh, is that um, there is a tremendous amount, this in blues and grays, these are mandatory spending uh, on the budget. So we have a, we might in 2019, we brought in revenues of three and a half trillion. We spent about a trillion more than that, mostly on the social, the social um, uh, support programs, social security, Medicare, Medicaid, and other, um, uh, uh, other, smaller mandatory spending. Um, we pay about 375, 400 billion a year. A good wedge of this is just the interest on our debt. And blue is the discretionary spending, about half of which goes to defense. Um, so again, yes, defense is considered a, a discretionary expense. So the non-defense part of the budget, frankly, doesn't have anywhere to grow <laughs> because we're already, um, spending more than we bring in, well well more than we bring in. Uh, and we're in this, and, and the science funding is in this relatively small wedge. Um, I, I brought up this 2019 budget because if you, 
uh, because the 2020 budgets were were a little crazy. And as we as we um, saw last year, um, we're beginning to have program after program that that is a, a, a trillion and a half, a trillion dollars. Things that start with T, that as that are so much larger than than um, any kind of program we've ever put on the table before that there's some question about in my mind anyway about where how we're going to actually pay for all that and how large this wedge of net interest is going to get so if if science is held or if federal spending is flat where could you go um, and where people are going now um, are to the foundations um, the, the new patrons, if you will. If, if Galileo were uh, around today, he and Musk would be buddies and he would certainly, not buddies, but he would certainly turn to, to, to Elon Musk for, for funding. Um, the fact of the matter is that the, the way that um, money has been distributed over the past uh, 100 years, especially the past 50 years, um, there's a, there are trillions of dollars in the hands of the top 500, the uh, 500 most wealthy people in the world. Um, and those people, um, not all of them, but some are, are beginning to turn that money back to science, um, and arts, but, um, I'm thinking mostly about science right now and to, to fund, um, science in terms of, uh, uh, people in the science, the scientists themselves, scholarships and fellowships. Uh, they fund research. It tends to be very thematic research and they fund prizes. For example, the Carbon Prize, there's a, the X Prize Foundation actually takes very large um, uh, incentive prizes um, from these funders to try to incentivize the creative evolution of science. So um, in many ways, that's what a Nobel Prize was. The Nobel Prizes were were also um, uh, were also designed to incentivize um, science, the best scientists to do more science. Um, but at this point, their their millions of dollars uh, look like peanuts compared to some of the amounts of money that these uh, particular foundations are putting on the table. Um, up to you know to collectively uh, in the billions of dollars per year now. So on par collectively with, nah, not on par, probably still an order of magnitude less than um, the federal government um, puts on the table. The, there are some pros and cons that come with the private funding. Um, and this was very much the same as, as, as uh, in the years of Galileo and others when, when patronage was, was last around. Um, many people feel that that foundation funding is useful to address the timidity of government funding. Government funding is felt in many in many cases. People feel that um, because government funding is so scarce, it it makes program managers um, quite afraid to uh, take on too much risk with their uh, portfolio. They have to show um, they have to show uh, benefit. Um, to their bosses. And so they tend to fund somewhat less risky science. Um, people would argue they fund science that's already half done by the time you get it uh, funded. Um, private funding is a way then to fund riskier projects and then to allow the private sector to buy down the risk of basic science or applied science that will, event that will have larger public um, public rewards. Um, and, it, and it does tend to prioritize areas that are neglected by other, um, by some areas of government funding. For example, it's very difficult to do vaccine research of all things in the, in the government um, uh, because immunizations just don't, that's not where the money is. And so pharma doesn't fund it and the US doesn't fund it much. Um, but uh, the, the Gates Foundation, as they began to take on very specific uh, global health threats, they, um, they made it a priority. Um, unfortunately, not all of the things that are funded by, uh, by foundations or private funding are particularly what we would call pressing national needs or priorities. 
In fact, if you match funder to what they fund, oftentimes what you find out is funders are, 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 are funding research to try to cure something that they are dying of or to cure something that they had a child die of or cure something that they perceive as a great threat. So there's a lot of focus as well in private funding on health um, that kind of takes the government NIH investment and triples it. So we're, we're putting a lot of money into health right now, far less into uh, other types of science. Um, it's, not it's also not inclusive. Um, <laughs> as Belle will tell you, as she's trying to break in, get, get us to break into um, uh, foundation funding for science, foundations tend to go to a very small group of people a very small group of institutions, Harvard, with names like Harvard, Yale, Stanford, um, and very famous scientists. And, and these, you know, people have heard of these scientists, they're going to fund them. They may not be um, the only scientist capable of doing that work. And Harvard is not the only university in the country, in the world. Uh, sorry for those of you who went there. But, but they tend to get an awful lot of this, this kind of funding. And so the, it, it, it very much creates a, a, a non-inclusive uh, environment where smaller schools and, and uh, people of color and scientists who, who are top scientists, but not in one of those institutions, they, they're excluded from funding. Um, and finally, there's no, they, they set the rules, the, the, the uh, uh, foundation set the rules. So they may or may not utilize a, a, a peer review process. Um, so, and then finally, like I said, there's simply not enough money in the, even in these uh, private funding to replace government funding for basic science. It tends to be very applied. And if you just look at individual and private funding of basic science, uh, in 2016, that's what this little red thing is. In 2016, they're estimated about $2.3 billion, billion dollars was, um, was put on the table for basic research, uh, relative, which is about an order of magnitude less than what the government put on. So it's a source of funding, but it's not the source of funding. And it, it has its own set of, of uh, pros and cons. Now, just I wanna look at the what, what we're looking at for R&D in the 2022 budget. This is Biden's budget and it has the versions of these bills have passed the Senate and passed the, the House, um, but they have not yet gone to reconciliation. And again, these, these are bills that are in the um, authorization bills. These are not um, funding bills, appropriation bills. So. There can some funny things can happen between when a government decides what it's going to fund and when it actually puts money on something. But R and D um, is for the first time in uh, two decades going to see a real increase um, in funding. Let's see if I can make this go away. A real increase in in funding uh, in the next budget if everything is appropriated as as it, it passes um, with a large increase in applied uh, in basic research, a large increase in applied research, some increase in development uh, in the uh, transition to, to market type things, an increase in facilities. Where things will suffer then are going to be because there's only so much money. Re re defense R&D is set for, and, and, and NSA are set for significant decreases. Um, already, uh, there's been quite a bit of back and forth about, about uh, NSF, there was quite a bit of back and forth as NSF, DOE, NASA, uh, NIH, ev everyone started uh, trying, to, to, um, trying to negotiate a larger piece of the pie for their own efforts. That that's, happens in the government. Uh, but, uh, but the net effect is there seems to be a lot of money there. And so the question is, where is it really going to go? I'm looking, you know, it, it looks like it's all, all going to go to science, but is it really all going to go to, is it all gonna be that simple or are there hidden ways that this is going to be directed? Not so hidden ways. To, to look at science uh, or NSF 
priorities, a good place to start is looking at publications from the National Science Board who, got, get, who are the visionaries for, um, for NSF along with the, the public. In their latest vision document, these are the things that they, rec that they identify as what should be the goals of NSF. And the first is that the NSF needs to deliver benefits from research. Um, that, this is kind of probably the, the most distinct statement that we need to try to, to move research more quickly uh, to um, impact, positive impact on the country. NSF has always been about discovery science and and for in, at least in the program managers for most program managers there wasn't much attention to application um, now they're saying that the us needs to be able to be competitive in fields of the moment like uh, quantum information for example and create the research environment that will that yields the new discoveries but for the practice of science and engineering to flourish, the enterprise must also show value to Americans. How do you do that? Oops. Okay, I got I, that one slide is out of place, sorry. The next is um, you need to develop STEM talent for America. Um, there's a, a, a description of people we're missing. They're called the missing millions. Um, NSF is keenly aware that domestically science is not a popular or not as popular as it should be. It's not a popular measure, especially in graduate level for US citizens. Uh, and so we need to, to, we have a very diverse population. They aren't necessarily in um, well-represented um, dem demographically in, um, in science and engineering. And so we need to, we, we can't just um, forget about what is now the majority of the population in the US, uh, we've got to bring all talent to the table and we have to expand the geography of innovation. So even as Bill Gates uh, and um, Paul, Paul um, Allen are either creating their own institutions in the case of Allen or Gates are giving money to very specific organizations, NSF is saying we need to um, distribute our research dollars more effectively. We need to redress the geographic inequalities and the institutional research inequities that are creating, making it so difficult to reach deeply into the talent pool. Um, we need to foster a global science and engineering community. So the US has to build partnership capacity at home uh, to respond to a more global competitive environment. We need to compete well with overseas, but we have to also collaborate overseas. So NSF is, this is, they're actually having some difficulty right now at NSF because NSF has always been a very transparent and agency and open to international collaboration. And within the uh, government and in the Senate in particular, parts of their bill very strongly address uh, the need to um, rein in collaborations with China uh, to prevent the leakage of, of uh, valuable, um, valuable technology and, and, and knowledge uh, to the Chinese. Okay, so I, let me go back up here. So when we look at how the NSF money, when you look into the details in the bills on how NSF money would be distributed, it's not going to be a schmear across all the, the agency. Um, they are, they are looking very specifically at creating academic research centers on key technologies. This is how they're going to address being current and being doing science of the moment. They're going to put a lot of money into student support and into support to those states that traditionally don't get a lot of NSF funding. That's not Texas. Um, there's going to be, so it's, so it's students, especially students from underrepresented groups, new, new centers for technology, especially those that are linked. They're looking to, to try to bring those together, um, spreading the wealth, uh, creating technological test beds, so they're, this is, and, and helping to commercialize discoveries. So this is 
translating the science more quickly to impact to the two people. Um, and so when you look at that, um, when you look at this, you realize that you, if, if you're just going to jump into your existing NSF program, your, your disciplinary program, and think that the money is going to be plentiful there, that's not where it is. And you best figure out a way to take what's in your existing program and combine it with, in some way with some of these areas of focused research uh, funding. So, um, so man is not going to um, come in every flavor. It doesn't for the, it won't be in every flavor for, for uh, the foundations. It won't be even as NSF gets more money, but instead uh, is going to require an emphasis on, on first uh, developing talent broadly and uh, collaborating with people, for example, in uh, HBCUs or in universities where they where the amount of money that's going to be given or that that is awarded is tradi traditionally very small, so finding collaborators at those those schools, um, and fostering a sort of a, a fostering collaboration um, more than individual uh, proposals. And in fact, and I looked at all the money. I don't have a slide for this. I'm sorry. I looked at, at, at where some of the new programs are in NSF and all of the new money that has come into NSF over the past uh, five years have been going to interdisciplinary uh, team-based projects, multidisciplinary, multi multi-institutional projects um, that are addressing a known scientific challenge and societal challenge like um, sea level change or, or, um, or uh, broadband connectivity. Um, so NSF is actually um, doing some scientific engineering across, across our economy. It's done it before, it did it with the internet, but it's taking on a much stronger position in there than it ever, than it has for a long time. And that means that we have to really rethink sort of the, the single PI hero of science model that uh, still persists in universe, a lot of universities uh, where the PI is at the top of the pyramid and head of all that he or she um, works on and sort of uh, of their domain. Um, and we need to see that as a model that tends to isolate and that tends to drive talent away rather than bring it on and to instead emphasize um, sort of a science with a little bit more focused orientation that uh, may have the benefit of, of uh, may benefit society. So you're letting societal issues drive your scientific research enterprise to a greater extent. And um, yeah, and, and, and again, restructuring towards, um, towards team, team-based science um, and team-based and collaboratively, collaborative science. Um, as far as uh, the Jackson School goes, BEG is perhaps the most advanced um, in, in that model of science. And I have um, really great, goal, great hopes that BEG can set a standard for, for JSG moving forward in terms of um, how to build uh, collaborative science, how to build um, towards uh, science that delivers solutions to society. So I think I'll stop there and um, see if you have any comments. I hope you have no questions. I don't know whether I could answer any questions, but I, hopefully you'll have some, some comments you want to add to this. Okay. Well, thank you, Dean Moore, for that talk. So if anybody has questions, you can unmute yourself at this time or you can ask them in the chat or comments. Okay. Hi. Uh, okay. Yeah, this is Duncan Young at, um, at UTIG. Um, I was uh, going to bring up this uh, kind of provo provocative um, essay that came from Lindy Alkins Tartan and um, Tart, yeah. Um, earlier this year, but um, from some of what you're saying, it sounds like you might have read it about- Yes, Christian I have. Yes, she uh, yeah. does the hero-based science. 
yeah, so um, I thought that's a very interesting take on on how to respond to the challenges and especially the context of the current federal funding. Now, I guess one, one question I'd have on that is you build groups to address these fundamental problems. Some of them take a lot of time, but sometimes the question changes. How do you be, be able to build these groups in a way that can be nimble? Um, I think uh, nimbleness is built by, you know, scientists having, um, having being involved in a number of projects. It, it, it will, it's unlikely in a team project that any one project is going to be able to fund an entire person year. So it's more likely that everyone's going to have multiple projects that they're working on. And the nimbleness really comes from people flowing between projects. And again, at BEG and UTIG both have this model, much more so, I think, than DGS, of, of people working in multiple teams. Um, and then as one project wraps up, half the team might go to another project and the other ones might be dispersed to, to, to simply other projects. And so nimbleness in part is just in, built in the funding model. Um, and uh, it, it's built in the in in the ethos of the scientists that this is this is a, actually a, a way of doing science that is productive, and uh, there's that um, there's no need to to do sort of to work in one area um, as a focus throughout your entire career. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dev was here. Dev, you always have something to say. Well, thank you, Claudia. This was so interesting. I was actually trying to get my daughter to listen to this with the initial part, at least. Um, you made two very good points. One is about um, something I'm observing. It is the popular scientists rather than the deep researchers who are primarily being coveted, so to say, by the foundations. Uh, and uh, this is because you said that they know their name recognition has to be there. And so we have traditionally been focused on publication as a matrix for rewarding. And perhaps we need to find a better way of encouraging and popularizing what we do such that we target more familiarity of the names to potential donors. Uh, I would like to get your thoughts on that. And the second is the one you mentioned about the, the non-hero based approach of a collaborative teams for a large reward, low probability outcomes. And again, how, how do we sort of maintain a reward system, so to say, that keeps particularly some of the teams in place uh, that they continue digging till they find gold? So your yeah. thoughts on both those would be great. Um, certainly changing metrics is going to be an important part of this. I'm, I'm, I know there's actually even discussions already with the dean, between the deans and the provost about um, changing some of the structure of the academic programs here. Um, I, right now, the programs are almost exclusively focused on PhDs with, with a, I mean, a singularly focused on PhDs. And in many colleges, master students have gone to what they call option three, or, you know, you, you pay and you might get in, you get a degree. Uh, so that they're built, they're viewed as money making, not as part, a central part of the research process. I, I think that that's a mistake, particularly in something like earth sciences, because we have to prepare students to get jobs, and they're not every student can get a research job as they emerge. It's just not possible. There aren't enough, and so we need to set students up for success. But that requires changing the metrics on how faculty are evaluated, how researchers are evaluated. Um, and it, it, it means being willing to go into some more gray areas of evaluation, like quote, impact, impact that's not derived by numbers of prizes, numbers of, of papers, um, but more by uh, clear evidence of, of impact to a group. You can point to a group, for example, your project on heat islands, that, that, that's not going to necessarily be one that generates a lot of publications, but it, if it generates a, a civic plan for improving heat spot, heat islands, um, the issue of heat islands in Austin, that should be a metric that would be used to evaluate the, 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 the importance of the science. Um, 
as for teams, that's a hard one. I mean, part of this is, um, part of it might be just changing the way we look at funding for, for science teams altogether. Universities spend a lot of money trying to push people towards, you know, trying to, to, to get more of the research enterprise to them, the externally funded ex uh, enterprise. They don't really think about what if you use that money to stabilize <laughs> your, your, your community more. Um, this is the, this was, and I'm, I'm sure somebody's gonna land on my head about FERSA right now, but um, this is, this is a, uh, one goal of a university would be to have stable jobs uh, at the expense of more jobs. Um, and uh, certainly at, at some place like National Laboratories, there's been a tremendous, there's been a recognition that they're, they're bleeding out young people, they're leaving, young people are leaving because there's no pension system anymore. So you have no golden handcuffs. And uh, it's just, uh, there are, the projects are simply don't pay enough to keep everyone going easily. And so uh, one is simply to, to go back to a model where an institution has, um, has a base of funding that is driven by uh, people doing work, almost like they would do for a company. They're working in, in the enterprise of doing science um, at some level, having that funding without necess necessarily finding it um, on, uh, on the open market. We have a few questions in chat. Uh, let's see, Sue Havorka asked, uh, do you think the BEG could do better in bringing in NSF funding and could it be a JSG collaborative effort? I think so now that now that NSF has started going to first of all larger projects with larger budgets and multidisciplinary projects I think it, it is possible for BEG to play because everyone's going to need to participate in those projects and and the the um, the the well, I have to say some program managers are actually quite used to when they see people who need, uh, who need salaries that they're willing to give them. But the recognition that um, they're going to have to provide more in terms of salary support across the board and not just, um, you know, one week, um, I think is, is, needs to be made. So I, I have to, I, I hope there is just because of the nature of the science and the fact that you that BEG could bring the expertise in delivering uh, solutions um, rather than uh, rather than delivering necessarily just the basic research results means that we should be able to play. And I am in fact interested in seeing that happen. Let's see. So let's see, we have a, a comment from Scott Tinker. He says, uh, thanks, Claudia. Fascinating review. A couple of things, uh, BEG team, sorry, my teams works pretty well, but we do quite, quite a bit uh, of what we would call practical or mission-driven science. Lots of names for this. But do you feel that approach can lead to true innovative breakthroughs? And does the NSF review process by peers allow truly innovative and risky science, science is getting funded? Uh, Listening, listening to Elon Musk on recent podcast, he was proud of his recent uh, rocket crashes, failures. Does NSF processes uh, process celebrate failure? The answer, in my opinion, is no. They don't celebrate failure. Um, they uh, most most of the of the disciplinary science is driven by uh, to to. Is, is not truly innovative. And I've sat on so many pa panels where people say, what is transformative? And everyone will say, this is transformative, that is transformative. When in fact, transformative science isn't, doesn't happen uh, very frequently, particularly in a discipline that's been around for a long time. I think where transformative science happens is when you take that science and you put it uh, with, and you move it to the intersection with other sciences, then what you're when then you're producing something that is by nature trans, that can be transformative because it's new uh, because because you're trying to do something that hasn't been done before. Um, so I actually think NSF is is really moving very strongly towards that 
that model and, and away from the incremental science um, that many of the pro many of the disciplinary programs have focused on. And the and the project managers are being encouraged to take more risk. And I know that there's a it, it's it's very program manager specific, but um, I think the community would like to see them take risk. And and certainly the the current NSF president or current NSF director is much more um, much more interested in seeing big successes, big successes, uh, and not that than seeing a whole you know one big success or two big successes rather than seeing a whole bunch of things that don't really matter. And that's why he's going towards sort of this model of rap, more rapid delivery and broadening the imp, broadening the the reach of the science. So I, I think NSF is just as incremental as anybody else in, in most cases. See, Jamie, do you have a question? Yeah. I mean, I Claudia, you've mentioned that the school is facing a transition uh, away from perhaps feeding the, the extractive industries towards uh, many points unknown. And this might go along with modifying the hero-based model, which is frankly coming out of the Renaissance. It's one of the biggest things that holds back academia headed towards a new, a new world. I, the Jackson School could lead in this. I mean, do you see the Jackson School making a leadership statement about modifying academic advancement in light of all of this new uh, funding, new opportunity. How do you feel about it? Oh, I think definitely that that is that is what I, I that's where I hope we're going. Um, it, it it has I have that's where I hope we're going is is to um, sort of moving towards moving towards uh, more solution based science or solution inspired science moving towards um, uh, a, um, an educational model that emphasizes the building of skills in students and, and celebrates the, the, their um, skill building across all levels, bachelor's, master's, and PhD, not just PhD. Um, and, you know, that I, I'd like to see, you know, as, as, scientists teach, as students learn this breadth of skills then they are, they're able to take on such a larger range of jobs in the in in the economy and uh, i i like to think that we're going to create geologists who still get out of school and do very well at, at, at their jobs <laughs> and i'd like to to see the scientists um solving uh, or working together more to solve um sort of some of the uh environmental and climate driven uh, challenges that we face, some of the energy challenges that we face. So I think that the Jackson School, because of the, its breadth can actually do this better than most, but it's going to take a fundamental change. I think in the part of many faculty in DGS who have been driven for 10 years in exactly the opposite direction. And so um, it will take some time, I think, to, to um, convince enough of them to, 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 uh, to adopt this position. But I think that we'll, I think we still have um, every opportunity to succeed that way and to promote ourselves that way. Uh, and the beauty here is that we have two out of the three organizations who are already doing that, so. Okay, well, thank you for your questions. And Dean Moore, thank you for your time. Really appreciated this talk. I think everybody was very excited. Well, thanks for listening. See you later. <laughs>